Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Hisham Faniri of the Department of Chemical Engineering at Northeastern University in the United States. This is our first uh, win lecture for the spring semester. Hisham was educated at the University of Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg, uh, France, receiving his MSc and PhD degrees in supramolecular chemistry. He postdoctored Scripps Research Institute in California before taking up a faculty position at Purdue in 1997, where he established the Purdue Laboratory of Chemical Nanotechnology. He joined NRC's National Institute for Nanotechnology, NINT, in 2003, and was also at the same time appointed a full professor at the University of Alberta. At NINT, he led the Supramolecular Nanoscale Assembly Program and contributed to the growth of NINT's uh, research programs and staff recruitment in the early days of its development. And I guess that at that time, I, was, I suppose I was his boss. <laughs> Dr. Feniri is internationally recognized for his contributions to self-assembly, supramolecular chemistry, nanomedicine, and material science. His group at Northeastern focuses on the development of nanomaterials such as organic nanotubes, metal nanoparticles, and nanocrystal and cellulose. And that for applications in drug delivery, medical device coatings, components for photovoltaic devices, catalysis, and nanocomposite materials. Quite a broad range of applications there. He's published widely with 130 publications, eight patents, and over 400 conference papers to his credit. He's also received several notable awards, including the 3M Faculty Award, the Cottrell Teacher Scholar Award, and the NSF, the National Science Foundation Career Award. He's been an invited professor at uh, uh, Strasbourg and Collège de France, as well as at NTU in Taiwan and Regensburg University in Germany. So please give a warm welcome uh, mm -hmm. to Professor Feneri, who will present his lecture, Engineering Biomedical Function in Supramolecular Nanomaterials, a Chemist's Perspective. Michel? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be introduced by uh, the boss of the boss of my former boss. <laughs> um, when I was recruited to, uh, to NRC in 2003, Arthur used to, uh, was uh, president of uh, the council before he became uh, advisor to the prime minister. And uh, uh, Peter Hackett, who was his vice president at that time, was the boss of Dan Weiner who was my boss, and then Wainer now is actually vice president of NRC. So it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Carly for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's my first time. So um, uh, I heard so much about the Waterloo uh, Institute for Nanotechnology, um, the nanotechnology program, and the graduate program at Waterloo. Um, and we tried actually to push U of A at that time to, to emulate uh, University of Waterloo, but uh, didn't have the courage, uh, I must say, because it's a very courageous step, and it's one of a, a kind in, uh, in, uh, in the world, not just Canada. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about these materials, how, uh, how we engineer materials um, using supramolecular chemistry, um, and how we can engineer function in those materials using principles of supramolecular chemistry. Um, I'm sure many of you may have heard about supramolecular chemistry or self-assembly, um, so I'm not going to dwell on, on that uh, in this presentation. That in itself is a very interesting philosophical question, um, but that's something that will transpire through my presentation. SNAG stands for Supramolecular Nascar Assembly Group. That's my group. This is our logo. So. Um, the, uh, so these are some of the applications of those materials that I'm going to describe in, in this presentation. Um, we have generated uh, uh, applications in catalysis, uh, especially cross-coupling chemistry. Uh, we have decorated these nanotubes with, uh, with, with uh, porphyrins. We can uh, have uh, multiple porphyrins on the surface of these nanotubes to mimic photo uh, systems, uh, bacterial photosystems. We have looked at coatings for implantable medical devices, bone and uh, stents, medical stents. Um, and we have looked at 
tissue engineering, cartilage tissue, heart tissue, and uh, bone tissue uh, regeneration. We also use these materials for, uh, for uh, uh, blocking uh, uh, cancer cells growth. This is in vitro study. And um, we have shown that when these nanotubes are decorated with the appropriate functionalities, they can bind to the surface of this cancerous cell and induce uh, uh, the apoptotic pathway leading to programmed cell death. Here uh, is another uh, aspect of this work where we combined multiple nanotubes to display mu multiple functions so we can target uh, specific cells or tissues. So this is, in a nutshell, the type of applications that we, are, we have been involved in. There are two or three other applications in, in, in oil and uh, uh, that uh, petrochemical industry that I was involved with when I was in Alberta. Um, but that are not covered here. So the outline of my presentation is shown here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about these nanotubes, their design and characterization, uh, their functionalization. We ha I'll show you some structural analogs, and I will, uh, if we have time, we'll go through one or two biomedical applications. How much time do I have? Uh, you have one hour, so okay. All right. So imagine a geometrical figure that has the ability to spontaneously form a ring, a super macrocycle. Uh, the notion of super macrocycle is not new uh, in supramacular chemistry. It was introduced by uh, Jean-Marie Lenn in France, a Nobel laureate, and uh, George Whitesides at Harvard many years ago. Uh, <coughs> Steve Zimmerman, Urbana Champagne, Andy Hamilton uh, when he was at, uh, uh, at uh, Yale. Uh, so this, this notion of taking molecules and assembling them into certain structures is not new. Um, but what I found interesting is that if you take a molecule that has this shape and create a circular structure, this circular structure ought to express a new set of properties, physical properties. And if carefully chosen, you can induce this structure to undergo yet another level of self-organization, uh, which may, we may refer to as hierarchical uh, step of supramolecular organization, where now the ring serves as a template for another ring and forms a tubular stack that you can compare to this dynamic tower. This is a proposed, actually, architectural real macrostructure uh, that was never built. But you can see that this, the architect who designed this tower uh, was planning to allow each floor to rotate freely 360 degrees such that each uh, uh, owner of, uh, of an apartment in this building will have a 360 view of uh, the surrounding uh, uh, scene. But what's interesting for me in this architecture is that it is actually quite similar to, to this one in the sense that it can have a helical organization, and this one is a right-handed helical structure, or super helical structure, or it can have segments of helicity, or it can be completely disordered. Um, it turns out that in the molecular or macromolecular scale, molecules are, uh, they talk to each other. They, to, for them to be randomly organized in this fashion, uh, in, a, in a tubular stack or a stack of this sort, is almost impossible. Uh, the worst case scenario, there would be segments of order and, and maybe some segment of disorder. But it turns out that in reality, based on a number of experiments we have done, that this architecture actually assumes a helical organization. And we have published a whole bunch of papers on that. And just the chirality of this system could be the subject of a one hour lecture. So I'm not going to get into the discussion. So how do we go about making molecules of this kind? We started from the natural DNA basis, guanine and cytosine, and we replaced the imidazole on the guanine molecule by this uh, cytosine uh, base. So we ended up with a GC base. This is a non-natural base that has no equivalent in nature. And it, the only uh, relevance, so to speak, to, the, to DNA is that it presents a donor-donor acceptor of hydrogen bonds and acceptor-acceptor donor of hydrogen bonds.
So it is self-complementary, and because of its geometry, uh, it can uh, undergo, uh, under the appropriate thermodynamic condition, it can undergo a, a self-assembly. You can modify this molecule such that you can insert additional ring between the G and the C phase, and I will show you the purpose of that in the next few slides. So when this molecule is put in water under uh, uh, neutral conditions or even uh, acidic or even slightly basic conditions, it spontaneously forms a ring maintained by 18 hydrogen bonds. And because of the, like I said, the geometry, of this molecule, uh, the only way for this molecule to satisfy its hydrogen bonding arrays is to close the ring, to form a circular structure maintained by these hydrogen bonds. And we established this architecture using solid state NMR, thanks to Arthur, and Rod Wasilation's 900 uh, solid state megahertz instrument uh, at NRC uh, Ottawa. Uh, we actually uh, have gotten, and this work has not been published yet, but it will appear soon. This is really the first example where uh, solid state NMR was used in, in, this, uh, in this type of uh, architectures. So we're very happy with this results. I'm going to take you through this very quickly. So uh, we, if you take an NMR spectrum of this molecule in solution, uh, well, it starts by some sharp peaks and then within a few minutes, it's completely flat. And that's because it forms large aggregates. So we decided to move towards solid state NMR uh, to, uh, to, uh, to overcome this problem. But solid state NMR, uh, you know, not any solid state NMR can handle this. We actually worked with the 21 Tesla instrument, the 900 uh, megahertz instrument uh, at NRC, and we, looked, we worked at the measuring angle uh, and spinning the, the, the NMR tube at 60 kilohertz. That's extremely fast. And the NMR spectra that you can get with, under those conditions are almost solution-like spectra. Uh, but in addition to that, what we have done is what we resynthesized this molecule with N15 labeled atoms. So we replaced all these nitrogens here with N15, okay? And N15 is, a, is a NMR active, so you can get very, very nice spectra, uh, N15 spectra. So what you see in this slide is about six years of work and about six or seven people, including three postdocs in, in the mix. So <clears throat> what we're trying to establish basically is that there is this hydrogen bonding array, that there is actually some correlation between these protons here uh, connected with this uh, green uh, bars, that there is a true bond uh, correlation between N3 and N6, which will establish unequivocally that this is a hydrogen bond structure in a circular fashion. N3 and N6 cannot see each other intramolecularly because they are separated by three bonds, okay, three carbons. The only way for them to actually talk to each other is through bonds. And the only way for them to do that is by forming this triple hydrogen bond. And so these are some of the spectra. So first of all, if you look at the top left in, uh, in, the, in A, uh, uh, here, what you see there is a proton, and on, uh, in B is the uh, N15 solid state NMR spectra. Look how sharp those peaks are. It's remarkable. Um, uh, so this can be assigned from the correlation peaks observed in the, uh, the 2D proton N15 heteronuclear correlation uh, spectrum, the Hector spectrum shown here. So this is uh, an N15 proton correlation spectrum and you can correlate who is connected to what. Uh, and from that you can uh, tell, assign each one of this, each one of, uh, of the peaks in the protons uh, spectrum. So now one thing, the first thing that you notice in this spectrum is that there is a peak here that is at about 13.7 ppm. And in this field, if you are working in the hydrogen bonding area, 13.7 ppm is usually the result of a hydrogen bond, an intermolecular hydrogen bond, okay? And so that was one indicator. The second thing that you should notice is that there are a series of correlations between HA, um, HA, HB, HB, HD, HD, HC that are shown in this 2D spectrum. 
Okay? So that's further evidence that these protons are actually in a, in a space uh, close to each other, especially this proton here and this proton here. On the same molecule, this proton cannot see this one because it's too far from it. So the only way it can talk to it is if it is intramolecular. Okay? Uh, the third thing to notice in this spectra is that the proton N15 to the hector shows a weak but a significant uh, correlation between Hb and, H and N3. This is N3, nitrogen 3, and this is Hb on the other nitrogen face in it. And there is a very nice correlation there. And so that's another indication. And the fourth, there are two more indications that really establish this structure by solid state NMR. Um, the N15, N15 to the DQ correlation spectrum, which is shown here. So this is N15, F15 correlation uh, spectrum shows a, a correlation between nitrogen 3 and nitrogen 6. Nitrogen 3 and nitrogen 6 can talk to each other only, again, through space. And this is a through space to the correlation spectrum. And finally, the N15, N15 to the inadequate uh, spectrum shown here shows a very clear correlation between, this is a true bond correlation between nitrogen 3 and nitrogen 6. And then there's a whole bunch of other things. The paper is going to appear uh, uh, hopefully in the very near future. We have a, uh, it's going under review right now. So, and you will see the additional details that we have uh, in support of this structure. But beyond NMR, there's also X-ray powder diffraction. Uh, uh, what you can see here is the, uh, the peaks that are characteristic of a hexagonal uh, unit cell uh, with a parameter, lattice parameter of 26.5 angstrom, which corresponds to the dimension that you would <coughs> expect for a structure of this kind. This particular uh, d-spacing that you see here, 3.5, corresponds to the stacking distances between the, the rosette structures. But if you are not really a believer, we also have an X-ray structure uh, where that shows the six-membered ring maintained by 18 hydrogen bonds. So this is a very nice proof, further proof of the uh, organization that I told you. This is just a model to show how the rosette stacks come together. And this one was functional with lysine amino acid on the surface, three and a half nanometer outer diameter, three nanometer core diameter, <coughs> and one nanometer inner diameter. This red dot, dotted area corresponds actually to water. And I'll show you how water actually plays a very important role in this architecture and its formation. Here is just an animation to show you how the self-assembly process takes place. Um, this is a molecular dynamic simulation um, that uh, one of my colleagues generated. Uh, this perhaps is a little bit long, so I'm going to accelerate it just to show you how the molecules come together. And form a tubular structure. This is a side view. And the one on the right is a top view of the same. So the way he, he did this is by actually uh, doing a molecular dynamic simulation, um, raising the temperature in silico breaking the structure basically uh, as he increases the temperature and then playing the process backward. So what you see here is the, the backward process of breaking the nanotube. So if we believe in reversibility, this should be true for the formation. Uh, and the TM image is, is here. What you can see here, each one of these lines corresponds to an individual tube. Uh, they can be extremely long. Some of them actually we cannot find the end of the tube. They're so long that we, you know, on, on one particular area of a TM grid, you don't see the end of the tube. But you can control the length by playing with the concentration and the solvents and, uh, and also the chemistry, what we put on the surface of these of this nanotubes. And you can see that they're monodispersed, three and a half nanometers in this case, um, and uh, across the entire, uh, entire grid. One question that I get all the time is the following. What makes you 
what, what, what makes you certain that the structure is actually a stack? Because when you think about a stack, the first thing you think about is that it can fracture very easily, whereas a helical structure would be much more stable. If you create a helical structure of this kind, it should be more stable. Or even better, if you create a double helical structure of this kind, you take two of these and intertwine them, uh, and maybe you can even offset them a little bit so that you can minimize the, re the repulsion interactions, you can create a fairly stable structure. The reason I don't believe in this structure, and we did a lot of uh, uh, molecular modeling uh, and calculations on this system and published it in ChemPhysChem if you are interested in the details of these calculations. The helical structure is not viable because the n plus 6 uh, unit is going to sit right on top of uh, the first unit or uh, this one, for example. And because of the repulsion, you're going to have nitrogen sitting on nitrogen, carbon on carbon, oxygen on oxygen. Those are going to be repulsive interactions. So that's not a viable option. So I, I challenged my, uh, my, my uh, collaborator that this is not viable. He said, OK, well, why don't we take two of these and offset them by 30 degrees, such that we can have the advantage of a stack and the strength of a, a helix. I said, you get me there. You're right. So let's see what, what the calculations tell us. It turns out that uh, the helix is less stable than the stack, uh, but uh, and when you look at the when you break down the energies into uh, internal energies, solvation energies, you find that the actual internal energies are not favorable, but that the 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 bulk of the energy actually is coming from solvation. Uh, you'll find that the stacking structure is more stable. However, when you take a double helix, the double helix is as stable as the stack, at least according to these calculations. And so the only way for us at that point was to go to the STM, to the molecular river, and see if we can see these molecules and see if we can resolve the structure. And indeed, in, in this image here, these are, there are four tubes here, a single tube here. This is the current profile. And from the current profile, we can see, we can get the the exact dimension, in this case it's 3.2 nanometers. You can see that the current profile drops in the middle uh, because the tubes are, are hollow. Uh, we can see that there is an increase in, cur in, in conductivity in, uh, in the periphery of the tube that's probably due to the charges on the side change. And a higher current density here probably due to the basis uh, on, uh, on the, and, uh, that make up the rosettes. But what's interesting is that you see these striations that you can see also here. Those striations are actually <coughs> distanced by, by about, uh, not by 3.5 angstrom, but by 7 angstroms. And that tells us that the STM actually can see one stack and, and, and misses the next stack. And the reason it misses the next stack is because the next stack is rotated by about 28 or 29 degrees. And so the current profile, when it reaches that rotated disk, is such that it shows an indentation in the, in the, in the structure. And this gives us further evidence that the structure is not helical. It is actually a stack. And we have additional images in support of this as well. So let's look at the self-assembly mechanism. <coughs> These structures come together um, through um, uh, through stacking interactions, hydrogen bonding, uh, London dispersion forces, and so on. Uh, but it's very hard to believe that a small molecule the size of a base, you put it in water, and it manages to come together into a ring. If you take DNA, for example, and for those of you who are working with nucleic acids, a double helix, if it's not more than 12 or 15, uh, nucleotide, it's not going to form a double helix, right? Because there's not enough hydrogen bonding in there to hold the structure together, okay? And then you have the charges on the outside that are going to pull those strands away from each other, and we have charges too. So what's bringing this structure together? And, and the question, uh, it's, the answer is, is multifaceted. There's no one answer, one quick answer to that question. 
but, but I'm going to give you some elements of answers to this. So for, for instance, what you can see here is as the self-assembly takes place, there's a drop in the association free energy, and that's because of the hydrogen bonding. But if you break down this hydrogen bonding and this association energy that you have here going down as the number of steps increases, it's only because of the solvation free energy. The actual internal energy increases. The bases actually don't like to come together because there are, there's electrostatic repulsion. But because the dissolvation of the base, the hydrophobic base, is so, is so strong, that compensates for this repulsive force and you end up with association. That's one thing. The second thing is the templating. If you were to take a ring and six units and assemble them separately, you take this six unit assemble separately from the other ring, each time you assemble it, there's a drop in energy, but the drop of energy is greater if the first ring acts as a template for the second ring. So there is a templating effect. There is a, uh, there is a an autocatalytic process, so to speak. A ring, one ring catalyzes the growth of the next ring. And here again, it's also due to this uh, uh, solvation free energy that drives the self-assembly process. So, uh, and there's a gain, and you can see that the gain increases uh, as the tubes get longer. So there's a cooperative effect. The longer the tube becomes, the higher the gain in energy uh, will become. And this is the number of rosettes, and this is the stacking free energy. And so this actually uh, validated some of the work that we have done many years earlier on the self-assembly process of this system. So this is a very detailed kinetic study that you can, you can read in, uh, in, in JAX that we published many years ago, where we established that the process of self-assembly is actually what we call a supramolecular chain reaction, where the, the nanotube itself catalyzes its own formation through fracture. So two forms, it fractures into smaller pieces, and each piece act as a template to grow additional tube. And so you have an exponential growth of this uh, nanotubes. And the growth is constant. It's continuously happening in solution. So that's why the structures are actually stable. Or at least they appear stable. The water, I told you, plays a, a key role. And when you look at the solvation of these nanotubes, you'll find that there is actually water lining up the inner walls of this nanotube, but there's also a layer of water, this one string of water molecules going down this tube. We have seen these water molecules by NMR, thanks to solid state NMR instrument at, at the NRC. We can see one peak for, uh, for the six molecules at seven ppm, and the other one at one ppm. Water by NMR normally appears around 4.8. So the shielding, the shielding, effect that you see here for these two bound and light, slightly bound molecules is clearly the result of this interaction with the, the nanotubes. And that water contributes 0.5 kilocalories per mole per water molecule. So you can imagine that for six molecules of water per disc and with thousands of discs, you end up gaining tremendously in energy. So this is structural water. And in biological systems, it's known that water can also play a stabilizing effect on, on structures. These are just uh, the water molecules organized inside the channel. And we can identify specific water molecules where we can see the hydrogen bonding of the water molecule with the carbonyl of one disk and another carbonyl of the next disk. So this bridging effect, this stitching effect actually stabilizes the structure. All right, that's enough for structure. Now let's look at some uh, chemistry. How many chemists are in the audience? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so this might be of interest to you. Chris, you're gonna have to go to sleep maybe for a few minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so the chemistry, I'm gonna go through it really quickly because really um, uh, much of this stuff has already been uh, published and and the chemistry is what we call bucket chemistry. Uh, we can do this in 100 grams quantities. Uh, although it's, these are long syntheses, each step is you know, very nicely uh, established. 
So we can do uh, SNAR, this is uh, aromatic nucleophilic substitution or coarse coupling chemistry and uh, to introduce substitutions here or we can do reductive amination, deprotection, alkylations to introduce functionalities in, in that side. So this is the standard, the first process that we have developed. Uh, we can make these molecules literally in 40, 50 gram quantities starting from 500 grams of, uh, of barbituric acid and in 12 steps, 11 steps here I, I about, uh, it depends how we count the steps, some of them actually without purification. So about 11 steps you can obtain this, this, this molecule in good yields. Um, and then once you obtain this molecule here, uh, you, can break, you can oxidize this double bond. Um, uh, first you protect the base with the, with the bark and then you, uh, with osmium tetroxide and sodium pyridate, you can convert this alkene to an aldehyde and then do a whole bunch of reductive amination reactions. And from that we made literally uh, over 200 derivatives of this molecule. Um, and it's very compatible with anything that has an amino group can be attached to, to this molecule. And we can make it self-assemble. So the functionalities that you can get on these tubular structures is, is virtually uh, unlimited. If you have a target or usage for one of these tubes and you want a functionality, you let us know and we'll, we'll provide it for you. So, so this is, these are some of the, uh, the amino acid that we have played with. Uh, these are some larger molecules. Uh, you can see here C60, porphyrins, uh, you have crown ethers, you have acridine type molecules, you have long chain uh, substituent, the C C12 uh, molecules, you have ligands for metals, this terpyridine uh, or this type of ligand here, uh, pyridine, uh, you have fluorinated molecules uh, and so on and so forth. Also we made oligothiophene uh, functionalized nanotubes. For example, this one here with six thiophenes attached to the tube on the surface has the same conductivity upon safe assembly as polythiophene. So it's basically an electric organic uh, conductor. But without safe assembly, it's not a conductor. It's only upon safe assembly that those thiophenes become organized on the surface and serves as, as conduit for, uh, for electrons. We also attached longer peptides so this one here is derived from the, uh, from the bone morphogenic protein 7, BMP7, specifically from the knuckle region responsible for the biological activity. This is one of the peptides that we have synthesized. There are a number of others that we have synthesized uh, for that region. Uh, this is a KR, uh, SR peptide uh, used for bone regeneration. And this is an RGD. RGD binds to integrin receptors on, on, on cells. And its uh, integrins are present on essentially all uh, living cells. Cross coupling chemistry is another approach. I'm not going to take you the, into the actual chemistry, so to speak, but we can, from this building block here, we can generate this structure. And the X group can now functionalize with an R group. And the R groups that we can make are numerous. I'll give you a, a table of that here. So uh, the substituents, R1, can be any one of these substituents here. And the point of this synthesis when we made these molecules was to tweak the electronic properties of this base so that we can use the tube that came out of this in organic photovoltaics. And you can see that we have put here electron donors, electron acceptors, conjugated molecules, and so on. So that gives us a way to tweak the homolumbo band gap of this molecule and hence the ability of the tube to conduct uh, electrons or, or holes. Okay, enough for the synthesis. So now let's go to the structural analogs of these of this nanotubes. How far can we take this concept? And here are some examples. Remember in one of the slides earlier I told you that we can, instead of having a bicyclic system, we can design a system that is tricyclic or even tetracyclic, okay? And each time you add a ring in this, in this molecule, this juicy motif, you are effectively affecting the energy levels of that molecule, okay? And 
the electronic states of that molecule. And with that, the ability of that the self-assembled structure to carry electrons or holes. So that was our reasoning. We said if we can take this all the way to something that looks like pentacene, we can have an organic conductor in one dimension. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of organic conductors, but when you assemble them, it's just a material. It's a, it's a two or three D, three dimensional conducting materials. There's no such thing as a one dimensional organic conductor. And this, is, this is, was one of the, our biggest goal uh, for, for a number of years, and, and we haven't reached that goal yet, but we are getting closer and closer. So this is the, uh, the, the parent molecule with one nanometer in a diameter. When we doubled the number of hydrogen bonds that each, that each one of these molecules can make, we can generate tubes that are extremely stable, and I'll tell you what we can do with those. So these ones, for example, don't melt. Uh, uh, in water, even at 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, John, we talked about those protein, uh, the, 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 the virus, uh, viral particles, and their stability uh, to about 80 degrees or so. Um, these ones behave just like those, the, those, those viral particles. This one melts at about 80, 85 degrees Celsius. This one at 100 degrees Celsius, uh, they are still there. And so because of that stability, we can now do a lot of other things with these materials. If you add one more ring here, you end up with 1.4 nanometer in a diameter. And if you have 1.4 nanometer in a diameter, now you can start functionalizing here and convert the hydrophilic character of this tube into a extremely hydrophobic interior. So you go from hydrophilic to essentially carbon nanotube interior for this, for this system here, okay? Because it has this ethyl group on this ring that points towards the interior of the channel. So the water that used to be trapped here is no longer there or not as tightly bound in this system here. You have different kinds of interaction holding the tubular structure together. The tetracycle will take us to 1.7 nanometers. And we completed this synthesis and we actually already published uh, one of the papers on, on one of the syntheses of, uh, of this system. So we can, we have this leverage here to, to control the, the, the diameter of the, of the nanotubes and at the same time play with their uh, electronic states. Um, then we have also a minimalist design. This is a, a four-step synthesis of this nanotube. Remember I told you about 11, 12 steps before? Now we can do it in four steps and generate a molecule in 30% yield. Um, and from that we can start functionalizing this molecule using exactly the same type of chemistry and create a, this one is a bright blue uh, uh, fluorescence uh, nanotube. When you shine UV light on it, it emits that beautiful blue light uh, uh, in solution. I don't have pictures of that, but it forms beautiful nanotubes as you can see in this picture here. So this one here is here, this one here, and this one is here. So, so we can control the inner diameter of these nanotubes and would like to start filling these nanotubes with a whole bunch of different things. Actually, this was published a long time ago. Um, I'm gonna skip the synthesis of this. Uh, you don't need to look at more synthesis, but uh, my group does a lot of chemistry, a lot of organic chemistry to make these molecules. Um, and I realize in retrospect how how risky that was when I started my career because, you know, a synthesis that took us three years before we actually knew that the molecule was going to self-assemble. But it was very rewarding at the end of the day. So what, uh, I mentioned something about conductivity earlier and how we can alter the electronic properties of the molecule by adding a ring in the system. So this is the tricyclic system with lysine amino acid on the surface. This is the tube when you, because of increased size of the module, the outer diameter has also increased to 4.3 from 3.4 nanometers, okay? The inner diameter is 1.4 nanometers, this one is one nanometer. So these are identical, the only difference is that this one has one extra ring right here between the G and the C phase. And it forms beautiful tubes as you can see here, AFM, SEM, uh, TM, SEM. But what's interesting about this system I published this in JAX a couple of years ago, is that as the self-assembly takes place, we start seeing this beautiful sharp band 
towards the red, around 390, 395 nanometers. And <clears throat> that band, you are in Tim Swagger's group, you know probably what J aggregates are. Uh, this is a signature <coughs> of a J-type aggregate. And one way to establish that it is J-type aggregate is to do steady state uh, fluorescence studies. And we did, and the stock shift that we obtained for that J-band is only about five to 10 nanometers, which uh, suggests, reinforce, or confirms that, uh, that this is indeed a J-type uh, aggregate. Furthermore, if you were to record the CD spectrum of this, uh, of this uh, self assembly structure, uh, at that particular band, this here at 390 or so, the ellipticity that we'll measure at that site is the highest ever recorded for any helical material. So it has a molar ellipticity of about three to four million. Uh, it's about 10 times higher than the highest known in the literature, which was published uh, some years ago by Tom Katz at Columbia University using helicines that form this, also these helical structures. So optically is also a very, it becomes a very, very interesting structure. And this is a very simple alteration. So I'm really, really, really curious to know what the tetracycle is gonna give us, because we haven't looked at the physical properties uh, of that system yet. But we anticipate that this band here, the, four, the 400 nanometers will probably shift to about 450 or 500 nanometers, and maybe this molar ellipticity will go up by perhaps five, tenfold, and probably the material will become close to a semiconductor, you know, a good uh, semiconductor uh, molecule. So, this concludes this particular part. Now, the internal functionalization that I mentioned earlier allows us to encapsulate all kinds of molecules. We can also think about catalysis applications uh, or insulated nanowires. But in terms of, this is just the chemistry. I'm gonna skip that. This is the uh, cross section of that tube with the ethyl groups in the middle uh, that line up the walls of this hydrophobic core. Uh, these are just images of those same nanotubes. As you can see by AFM, SEM, and TM that they form beautiful nanotubes. They also give a very nice uh, J-band. It's, it's weaker in this case, but it's there. And we have nice CD spectrum. But we also can use these molecules to encapsulate uh, drugs such as this, uh, this anti-cancer agent, uh, dexamethasone and tamoxifen, uh, uh, so we can not only capture but also release over a certain period of time. Uh, we haven't looked in detail in the kinetics of this process, but uh, that's something that will require us to do more studies. But suffice it to say that because of the hydrophobic character, we can encapsulate hydrophobic molecules and we can release them slowly. The kinetic of that process is still under study. So, this is the largest inner diameter one uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, the tetracycle. And the chemistry was published uh, recently. I'm not gonna take you through that. I'm gonna skip this chemistry slides and take you, uh, basically this is the, uh, the final structure that we have obtained. I'm gonna take you directly to, uh, to the tuning of the stability of these nanotubes. All right, so after this, I'll have to accelerate a little bit. So when I started my talk, I mentioned this particular GC motif with lysine amino acid, and uh, that forms a rosette. In this system, what I have done, what we have done in our group, is incorporate two GC motifs through a, a spacer or linker um, into a single molecule. So this molecule expresses two GC motifs, in other words, the ability to form 12 hydrogen bonds instead of six hydrogen bonds. And when this molecule self-assemble, it forms a twin rosette. One rosette on top of the other, connected covalently by these little bridges. So they are, it's stitched together by six bridges. So this entity here is maintained by, uh, well, 36 hydrogen bonds instead of 18 hydrogen bonds. It's a double number of hydrogen bonds. And as a result, it also forms 
tubes, but these tubes are much less congested on the surface, as you can see, this one relative to this one. Less congestion, less charge, okay? less steric repulsion, less electrostatic repulsion makes this nanotube extremely stable. And when you look at the melting studies, this is the CD spectrum of the one with only one ring at a time. It melts at 85 degrees Celsius. And when you cool it, it goes back to the initial CD spectrum. This one here at 95 degrees Celsius, basically in a cell uh, when water starts literally to boil, there is a decrease of the CD spectrum, about 40%. And then we cool it down, it goes back to its natural state. It's so stable that we said, let's try something interesting. Can we use these nanotubes to select chir chiral car carbon nanotubes, uh, separation of carbon nanotubes? Uh, this, I'm, I'm addressing Shirley right now. Uh, carbon nanotubes separation is, uh, is, is a challenge. And you, know, you, get this, you get this beautiful materials, but uh, their function depends on their chirality whether they are conductor, non-conductor, or semiconductor, depends on their chirality. And the idea that we had is, can we use these nanotubes, because they are chiral, to capture one particular set of those carbon nanotubes? And it worked. So what we've done here, a, we, uh, this is just an animation of the self-assembly process of the GC motifs around one carbon nanotube. This is a uh, six six single wall carbon nanotube was prepared uh, by a colleague at uh, Texas Tech University, uh, Mark Green, and uh, we studied the optical properties at Los Alamos National Labs uh, and established that indeed uh, there is uh, direct encapsulation of these nanotubes. But I have visual uh, image of that where we have rosette nanotube. This is actually holy carbon. For those who are familiar with TEM, there are, there are areas where the carbon film uh, is, uh, is, is broken. And so when you have rosette nanotube that crosses those, uh, those breaks, it vaporizes because it's organic material, organic matter. Whereas carbon nanotubes that are metallic, they don't vaporize uh, under uh, the electron beam. And so as the, rosette nan the carbon nanotube inside the rosette nanotube cross, this, uh, this uh, broken uh, parts of the film, the organic matter vaporizes, but the carbon nanotubes stay uh, between the two uh, parts of the film. So such that this led us to further confirm that the carbon nanotubes are indeed encapsulated inside this rosette nanotubes. Here is a, another type of interaction where we speculated that the rosette nanotubes are actually growing perpendicularly to a carbon nanotube in this fashion. So, and because of the hydrophobic nature of the surface. Um, this is just a TM image showing one rosette nanotubes with a carbon nanotube in the middle. Uh, this is just more images showing the same. Uh, you, have, you can see the carbon nanotubes here and the organic matter on, on each side. But the best image, in my view, is this one, where we can actually see a carbon nanotube and a rosette nanotube uh, basically around it. So this is a, a, a heterostructure that has been peeled in this particular segment. So, so this is further evidence that we can encapsulate a carbon nanotube. Now we can think about potential biomedical applications. Uh, those ultra short, for example, uh, carbon nanotubes could be encapsulated inside these rosette nanotubes and delivered to a particular target. And uh, we can use uh, perhaps uh, infrared radiation to uh, induce a local ablation of uh, cancerous tissue or some other targets. Uh, with the same nanotubes that are now extremely stable, what can we do? We started looking at growing nanoparticles on the, on the surface. And here, we basically take that stable system, and what we do is we add the metal. And normally, when we started, we started adding a reducing agent, like hydrazine. Uh, or it turns out that later on, we don't need the reducing agent. We can do an electrolysis deposition of the metal on the surface of this uh, rosette nanotubes and obtain this type of structures. So in this case, it's palladium. 
uh, well, gold, palladium, and platinum. And you know, when we do electrolysis deposition, the size is 1.21 uh, with a very, very uh, narrow distribution. Uh, this is a dark field image that shows the particles on the rosette nanotubes. And you can see that the particles grow only on the nanotubes. The mechanism of this process is very, very fascinating. And we published the gold system, but we haven't published the platinum and, and palladium system yet. So this is just additional images showing that this is a site-specific nucleation growth and morphogenesis of nanoparticles, and that they are organized in a non-random way. They are about 1.4 nanometer in diameter with polydispersity index of 1.04, uh, which led us to suspect that these gold particles are actually Schmidt's cluster, gold 55 which has exactly 1.4 nanometer diameter in, in, uh, 1 nanometer in, in diameter. But in addition to that, Schmidt's cluster, uh, structure of which was published in science just four or five years ago, has actually 12 coordination sites on its surface, stabilized by, by, you can stabilize it by phosphines, for example. And uh, it turns out, actually, that on the surface of our nanotubes, that there are actually 12 coordination sites where we can capture this gold 55 and stabilize them. So bind to them, we grow them there, they grow until they reach 55, and then that's a magic number for gold, gold clusters, and, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's stabilized. And the, the model that we came up with and published is this one here, where we have a zigzag structure. So now we can label these nanotubes with gold, palladium, or platinum, but we can also label them with other type of molecules, in this case, MAG3, that can bind technetium. So we can do SPECT imaging. Uh, this one is SF, uh, SFB, which has a fluorine, can be fluorine 18. So for another type of imaging. This one is FITC, is fluorescent label. So we can do fluorescence imaging. Um, so in summary, for uh, this, uh, this presentation so far, is that we have materials that are synthetically accessible, chemically, physically, and biologically tunable. They are biocompatible. We have established that in a number of systems, in animal models as well. They're non-toxic. They're multifunctional. So we can incorporate functionalities uh, either to target a particular cell or to kill that particular cell. Um, we can do a targeted delivery by, by targeting specific receptors. And we can encapsulate certain cargoes and deliver it in uh, specific, uh, uh, specific uh, tissues. So I could stop here, or I could tell you about siRNA delivery. <laughs> so very, uh, Arthur, do I have a Five couple minutes. minutes? Five minutes, OK. So this is a, so, so what we've done here is we, we, we took those nanotubes, functionalized them with the, um, since we now know how to functionalize them and play with them and control the charge on the surface, we thought that siRNA delivery, and you look at the literature on siRNA delivery, uh, it's basically polymers, cationic polymers. And what we have been making all these years is basically cationic polymers. The only difference is that they are, they are non-covenant structures. They are self-assembled structures. And so we can do, uh, we can capture, so the idea basically is that if we take RNTs, rosette nanotubes, with lysine amino acid on the surface, we can effectively complex our RNA and protect it from biological degradation. So that's key number one, to prevent degradation of RNA, which is very, very sensitive to, to uh, RNAs. So we know that RNTs are safe, efficient carriers. We know that RNTs can mediate effective RNA silencing. Um, uh, and, but we don't know yet if they can have a therapeutic capacity. So that's something that we need to explore. So this is the, the nanotube that we have investigated. We took the, the very stable system that I mentioned earlier with the two bases, and we attached up to 15 lysine amino acids on the surface, from 1 to 15. So we made 15 different nanotubes, and we looked at the self-assembly process. And this paper, uh, just the synthesis of this uh, molecules and the study were, are going to be on the cover of nanoscale in, in a couple months. So just the characterization of this material. Uh, now, in terms of their application, we can combine them with, we take those lysine functionalized, we add RGD to them, and we end up with the RGD functionalized nanotube to target specific tissues, and then we take them to cells. 
Okay? We take siRNA, those nanotubes, siRNA labeled with green fluorescence, and we look at how those nanotubes behave in the presence of certain cells. We looked at about at least, at least uh, two dozen cell lines. This one is mesenchymal stem cell, this one is a primary human fibroblast, kidney cells. So this is without the nanotubes, these three here, and this is with the nanotubes. You can see the green fluorescence close to the nucleus that is shown in blue. The, so the, 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 the nuclei are, are labeled in, in blue. Another series of cells, this is human breast cancer. Uh, this is human uh, chondrosarcoma cells. This is an epithelial, this is skin cell cancer. Uh, here's an, uh, another uh, family of cells. This is rat astrocyte, mouse macrophages. This is primary chicken liver cells. And in each case, the, the, the RNA goes in essentially with 98 to 99% efficiency. So it's a, it's a remarkable system. We even tested it in an animal model. And it goes in, we can do imaging of the ASA RNA uh, as it binds to its target cells. So with that, I'd like to close with a quote from Leonardo da Vinci. Where nature finishes producing its own species, man and woman, this is the colloquial man, begins using natural things and with the help of this nature to create an infinity of species. Thank you. Thanks for an excellent lecture. Are there any yeah. questions? Ah. Well, the way we want to do that, I mean, uh, what you're proposing is, uh, is extremely interesting. That's the sort of thing I'd like to do if, if I could live for 200 years. And, and that's one of the things that I'll probably do at some point in my life. But um, uh, what we're trying to do to reach that, that specific aim is to, uh, to control the, the growth of the tubes in a, in, a, in a way that you control the synthesis of, that you use DNA synthesizers to control the length of a DNA uh, uh, double helix. To be more precise, if we can take the GC base and, and turn it into a phosphoramidite, okay, and the automated DNA synthesis into an oligomer, okay, that oligomer, you can incorporate functionality any way you want in that structure. And when it self-assembles, it will position those functionalities exactly where you want them. In other words, you, you have perfect control in that case. And we made the phosphoramidite, but we are still far away from getting the right protecting groups for DNA synthesis. Yeah, we can do NMR uh, in solution, but what you see is not the self-assembled structure. Because our aim when we did NMR was to look at the hydrogen bond network. If you heat it up, you're going to break it and you get beautiful spectra, yeah. So is it a represent a small molecule, or is this kind of different with the small molecule? Uh, in terms of, by NMR, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you take, uh, if you take this, uh, let's say, uh, a nanotube that is assembled, okay? If you put it in an NMR spectrum, uh, in an NMR tube, uh, you're not going to see anything by NMR, okay? Because of all the dipolar couplings, okay? And if you break the structure, because it's just line broadening, it just broadens and becomes completely flat, okay? Uh, when you, if you, if you heat, the sample, let's say you do the experiment in DMSO or even in water, you heat it, you break the structure into molecules or small aggregates. Then you start seeing the nanotubes, and we published that. 
we, can, we have actually two DNMR spectra that show that there is actually correlations supporting the hydrogen bonding. We published that long time ago. Did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Is it a, I just want to know, is it high temperature breaks hydrogen bonding or breaks static? It breaks everything. So the rosette, nano, the rosette itself is a transient species. The rosette is an intermediate. It's not a stable entity in water. It's too hydrophobic. It's way too hydrophobic for it to survive uh, in, in an aqueous environment. The only way you can see a rosette is if you functionalize it with organic substituents and put it in hexane or uh, chloroform or dichloromethane. And there have been papers, Jean-Marie published uh, the rosette structure. He claims that he has uh, an MR spectrum and he sees a chemical shift around 14 ppm indicating hydrogen bonding uh, a long time ago. No, you can't, because of because of the size. Line broadening. Yeah. So what we what we do to to do that is we we take a suspension of carbon nanotubes, okay, in uh, usually in water plus a little bit of DMSO one or two percent, okay? So it's a suspension, it's not, it's not carbon nanotubes are not soluble, obviously, in, in that environment. And then we add the powder, uh, G0, one of our modules, powder, in that solution. And as it dissolves, it finds the carbon nanotubes. It just binds to them in a, in a, in a, in a probably, probably a non-specific way, okay? And then as the safe assembly takes place on the surface of the carbon nanotubes, then you start organizing the tubular structure around the carbon nanotubes. So it's not taking the carbon nanotubes and, 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 and inserting it inside the rosette nanotube. You need a, perhaps we can do that if we had very short carbon nanotubes. So in the system TM, you just take the individual organic tube and the whole part of the tube. Do you see this? Yeah, we can see both, yeah. Or, or you only see the bone species and the hydrogen tube? No, we, we can see both. Yeah, I showed you a slide where we have both. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, actually, I'm also working on the SR theory, so uh, All right. it's very great to see like, the, at the end of your talk to see that part. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question about the, what's the size of your particles for the SR theory? The size of the nanoparticles? So uh, we, I have actually some slides on that to show you how, how actually the mechanism of that work, we're using TM and so on. So the way we do it, uh, we take our, our nanotubes, uh, one specific kind of nanotubes, and we mix it with SRRNA. So we form these large aggregates. They are pretty messy. And when you look at it by TM, you can see that they're actually large blobby areas. Then we, before we actually use it in cells, we subject it to ultrasound to break it down. Very important step. And, and the timing also is very important. So we break it down into smaller pieces that look like little rafts, okay? These are basically assemblies of rosette nanotubes, SRNA, rosette nanotube, SRNA, and so on. So those, those pieces are under 100 nanometer, 100, maximum 200 nanometers. And those can enter the cell without any problem. What kind of what? What kind of like pathway? So the cellular uptake pathway. Oh, the pathway is endocytosis. Endocytosis, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it goes into an endosome and then it's released on the other side. So we, we looked at the, we labeled them with fluorescent labels. We can see the, uh, the tubes <laughs> sticking the, to the surface of uh, the cells. And then we can see them internalized. We can see little dots, endosomes, filled with fluorescence. And then it's released. And then the way it makes its way to DNA, I don't, uh, to, to the nucleus, that I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to the question. But um, we, we haven't done any uh, a, a, 
uh, nuclear, uh, you know, uh, guiding peptides, or we haven't decorated our nanotubes with anything that would guide uh, the nanotubes to the nucleus yet. Uh, but that's one of our aims. But so far it works. So, so uh, we are trying to understand how it works. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is possible. Because, uh, so uh, if you ask me if we were able to remove all the water, I'll tell you I don't know. And probably we don't. There's always a little bit of water that stays. The reason is because these are charged molecules, they are very hygroscopic, they're going to pull water from the air. Okay? And if you want to remove every trace of water, you're going to have to do some drastic drying. Uh, use of drastic drying methods. Uh, one day I actually uh, asked a student to really try everything possible to dry the sample. And he, and he did. That's a long time ago. And that sample in particular did not self-assemble. Uh, so that was a one case. We didn't actually push that study too far. But that led me to suspect that water probably plays a very important structural role. Now, if you take methanol or DMSO or DMF, there's always water in there. Even if you dry it, uh, there'll be trace of water. And you don't need a lot of water for these things to come together. And once the structure is formed, then the role of water may no longer play a crucial role, uh, a crucial part of the, of the process. It's just getting that first tube to grow, and then it acts as a template for its own growth. I think Shirley wants to ask a question. Yeah, Shirley, yeah. yeah. Yes. How, how selective is it? It's, it's, it's selective. We tried 6-6. Six, six, and we try. I, I cannot remember the exact uh, 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 type of carbon nanotube that, that my colleagues tried. They were tried, actually, at uh, Texas Tech and, and Los Alamos. And uh, the only one that worked is the 6-6, six, six, because its diameter is uh, about 0.9 nanometer about nine angstroms or so, 9.1 9 angstroms, something like that. And our inner diameter is 1.1 nanometer, so it's perfect size for it. So in terms of chirality selection, I don't have a definite answer to that. We need to try a few more things. But we know that we can select one type of carbon nanotubes out of uh, at least four different kind of carbon nanotubes. Yeah, 100 to 200, but not more than that. Um, can we, uh, we did, so this study was uh, done by biologists. They, uh, they really don't pay attention to the material part. So we give them a material and, 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 and they test it and, and, and it's working. But if it was done in my lab, what I would do probably is look at different uh, sample preparation methods uh, and see how dimensions, uh, uh, sonication time periods uh, would have, uh, what effect they would have, maybe even uh, aging time and so on. So these are very important parameters that will allow you to tweak not only dimensions, but also perhaps the effectiveness of, uh, of uh, delivery. Okay, so the templating effect in this context is, um, let, me, let me go back to that slide. If you, if you look at this slide here, um, Um, you can you can actually the paper was appeared in Kenfi's game I think in 2010. If you wanna if you wanna look that up. This is the difference between the two pathways. 
the two pathways are <clears throat> one pathway we have one rosette and six molecules of GC base. And we assemble those six molecules one at a time without interaction with this rosette. Okay? So we just calculate the entire the total, total energy of the system. And so we form the first hydrogen, triple hydrogen bond, then we bring in another molecule. We have three molecules, four molecules, five, and then six. Okay? And each time you add more hydrogen bonds, the energy of the system drops. Okay? And in this case, what we did instead of going, going this pathway, we actually put the first molecule on the rosette. So there's a stacking interaction. Okay? That stacking interaction adds stabilization, but also upon hydrogen bonding, it brings the energy further down. So from this study, it is, this is a modeling, but we have also experimental data. But from this study, it appears that the stacking, the templating of the formation of the second rosette is facilitated. The energy pathway to forming the next ring after the first one is formed is easier. Okay? So this is the templating effect. So, so this is the simulation. Yeah. Also yeah. So <clears throat> the, the experiment was published seven years earlier. And, um, and this is a fairly detailed kinetic study if you want to look it up. So here what we found, uh, this, is, this is a very, fairly long explanation. It's going to take probably about 10 or 15 minutes. We can, if you want, I can explain it to you uh, after the talk. But briefly, there are two pathways. There is a fast, slow pathway and a fast pathway. The slow pathway is when the module uh, is not pre-assembled. And we have conditions under which we can prevent that. Okay? So it's low concentration. Now, we were very lucky in this system in a such that, in a way that this module has a crown ether. And this crown ether binds to this promoter. This promoter is actually an amino acid. An amino acid has an ammonium group. It binds to the crown ether. OK? All right? Follow me. Now, as, as soon as it binds, it actually liberates this base so that it can undergo self-assembly because this crown ether actually hydrogen bond to the base. OK? So it prevents it from self-assembly. When you add the, the amino acid, it opens up the molecule. And now the molecule can form a ring. OK? So that's why we call it a promoter. It forms the ring, and then it self-assembles into it, too. And we can follow the kinetics of self-assembly very, very early on. And the kinetic shows a sigmoidal growth indicative of an autocatalytic process. So the, the kinetic type, the, the nature of the kinetic uh, profile is in agreement with an autocatalytic process. So there's initiation, and then there is uh, a re We, we, this is, was done by, uh, by fluorescence, no, by uh, circular dichroism, because it's done at a very low concentration. NMR is not going to detect this. This is sub-micromolar concentration. OK, well, I think I'll finish by, uh, by saying that uh, you know, it's a measure of the interest in your talk that I haven't been able to get a question in. OK, <laughs> thank <laughs> please, you. Please join me in thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.